that again with the microphone on. Good morning. Good to be with you. Let, let's pray. Father, uh, I pray for the preacher who's not worthy of these words but by your Spirit. I pray for our staff at this church who are working against many difficulties to help love us and help us love one another and love you well. We pray for those in our church that are sick, who are, who are beaten down by the circumstances of life, for those who face diagnoses or broken relationships. We pray for our pastor and his family on sabbatical, that you will lift them up, give them clarity, rest, joy, and peace. And we pray that you'll open our hearts to your word, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. So how do you feel? <laughs> Some of you need to be more honest. <laughs> how do you feel is a question we often use to help kind of take the temperature of what's going on in our lives. It would be weird if I opened the question this way. How should you feel? Because we usually don't connect the word should with the word feel. Feelings just happen. There's no should about them. Except that's really what a lot of the Psalms are about. They're telling us how if we really grasp who our God is, how we ought to feel because he is the way he is. This morning we take a look at yet another one of the psalms of lament. Last week we looked at a psalm of lament that really focused on lamenting because the vulnerable, the weak, the poor, the fatherless, the widow are so easily abused in our society. And we don't know where the complaint desk is to register complaints, except we register them before our God. This morning, it's a different issue. It's an issue of slander, being mocked, being shamed, and beginning to doubt him. How should you feel? Psalm 4, let's read it. Answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have given me relief when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. O men, how long shall my honor be turned into shame? How long will you love vain words and seek after lies? But know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. Be angry and do not sin. Ponder in your own hearts on your beds and be silent. Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. There are many who say, who will show us some good? Lift up the light of your face upon us, O oh Lord. You have put more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and wine abound. In peace I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O oh Lord, make me dwell in safety. Once again, the psalmist opens with a complaint, because life doesn't look 
doesn't feel like it ought to if we are children of God and He's making all things right. You've had that experience. I've had that experience. You, you go through life and people don't treat you the way you ought to be treated. You go through life and things don't happen the way you think they ought to happen. Well, he starts with this. Answer me when I call, O God of my what? Righteousness. What does that mean? Think about this now. We, we, so critical to reading the Bible is understanding the words, definitions. Answer me, O God, the one who makes everything right. That's what that means. You're appealing to God because He's the one that makes things right. God, I'm calling on you here. You're the one that sets the world to rights. And then he says something very interesting. You have given me, this is past tense, I'm calling on you because I've got a track record with you. You have given me relief when I was in distress. You know, translating the Bible is hard work. Uh, I've, I was trained by, by people who taught me Greek and Hebrew, and they were both part of the translation teams that worked on the NIV and later translations. And I remember seeing them in their offices by the hour working on little phrases because the Bible is in ancient languages and Hebrew especially is a language of poetry. It's hard to translate poetry, right? So let, let me translate this, this little middle part of verse 1. When he says, you've given me relief when I was in distress, what he really says, I was constrained. I was, I was all tied up. I was knotted up. I, I couldn't breathe. That phrase lives today, doesn't it? I can't breathe. That's not just a physical description. That means my whole life was in a knot. I, I couldn't run with freedom and joy. Oh God, I'm supposed to flourish before you and I can't. Well, why? Now we go down to verse 2. It's interesting how the psalmist writes this. He starts talking to God and complaining, and then he turns his attention to the world around him, and he says, Oh, men, humans, you people who deny our God, oh, men, how long will you turn my honor into shame? What does that mean? Well, slander. What does that mean? Well, if God is the one whose honor I live for, and they mock me for it. You get that? If God is the one whose honor I live for, and they mock me for my values. They mock me for my faith. They mock me for my decisions because my decisions are made based on a firm foundation of honoring my God. Maybe some of you have been there. Maybe, maybe you've been there at work where the boss says, we have one metric of success here. We make money. And you and your positions are costing money. Your job is to get it done and sell product, make deals. And you say, my word means something, and I gave that company my word, and now you want me to go back on my word? I can't do that. That can cost you your job, you know? That can cost you your job. And you, and you look at that circumstance and you say, Oh God, how long will you let them shame my honor? How long, how long will you put up with them mocking my faith? You, look, folks, you can talk about that individually. You can talk about that culturally. 
You know, the answer in our culture is not one side of a political spectrum. It's a completely different axis. We stand for Him. We stand for Him on every level. And I tell you what, this culture doesn't understand us. They don't understand people for whom honoring God is everything. And they will shame us for it. And then he says, how long will you love vain words and seek after lies? Yeah, that's another one of those hard to translate phrases because it sounds like all he's talking about is words. I got I to gotta help you understand that. Vain is the word empty or emptiness. I one time was introduced, uh, I was with a friend, I was at a at a, a gathering where there were a bunch of politicians and there was a senator in the corner and I said to the person who had brought me, isn't that senator so-and-so? And my friend was not very nice. He said, yeah, he's an empty suit. You ever heard that phrase? He's an empty suit. You open up the buttons, there's nobody inside. Well, that's, that's what he's talking about here. But he's not talking about people. He's talking about gods. You see, the world worships many gods. Gods of sex, freedom, I can do whatever I want with my body. Gods of power, what really matters is that I have to gain more power. Gods of money, wealth, success. Those are gods, right? Those are gods that we invest in. They are gods of comfort and ease. I don't want to suffer. We put our hope in empty suits. There's nobody there when you call out. They don't answer. That's what he says here. How long, men, you, you, you people who mock me for my faith, how long will you love the empty and chase after the lie? That's a, that's a main biblical theme. You go to Isaiah 44, 45, 46. I encourage you to read that. He talks about, he talks about God's people who take a, a stump, a, a, a block of wood, right? And they chop this thing in half. And they chop the one half into a bunch of little pieces. And they use it to build a fire, to cook their food, and heat their house. And with the other half, they take carving tools and they carve a god out of it and they put it on a rock and they get down on their knees and they pray to it. And Isaiah says, you fools! It never answers you! Folks, idolatry isn't an Old Testament problem. When John wrote his epistles, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, the last verse of 1st John, last verse, my children, keep yourself from idols because they're empty suits. They don't answer. That is the psalmist's problem. He knows that when he calls to God, the God of righteousness, he's going to set me free from the things that constrain me, but I live in a world where they slander me, they mock me for my faith, they, the culture, the world around us, the people you work with, they have gods, empty suit gods, but they have them, and they want me to worship them, but those things don't answer. Now, now we turn. I know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. The Lord, the Lord. You see, that? you see the way it's printed in your Bible? Capitals? I told you a couple weeks ago, I keep telling you that you've got, you got to know this. When you see all caps LORD, it means Yahweh. Yahweh, the, go the God Moses met at the burning bush, and the God who said to Moses, go back, bring my people out of Egypt. And Moses stood there with a mouthful of teeth and said, uh, I don't know your name. And God says, Yahweh, the God who is. What a weird name. By the way, it's all over. We sang it this morning. 
Hallelujah. Yahweh. That means we praise the God who is. We, we come here because His name is Jesus in Hebrew, Yahoshua, Yahshua. Yahweh saves. That's His name. I mean, we're, we're all about these names. This, this, is, this is big stuff, right? No, I know, I know that Yahweh has set apart the godly for Himself. What does that mean? Well, that means who you are, your identity, is defined by your relationship with Him. Your identity is not defined by your job. Your identity is not defined by what you have. Your identity is not defined by the people group that you are in, although they reflect it. Your identity is defined by Him. He has set you apart for Himself. You, you, you got to understand this, that that's the particular sin that God's people throughout the whole Old Testament made. They knew they were special. They forgot why they were special. They were elect, they were called, they were chosen, they were set apart for Him. Boy, if, if I go down, Jim, get a crane and pick me up, okay? Um, identity. But number two, access. Know that the Lord has set apart the godly for Himself. Yahweh hears when I call to Him. The empty suit gods, they don't hear. They don't answer. My God does. You see, there's a way life doesn't work, and when it doesn't work that way, I, I, my, my, my reaction to it is confusion and despair, and it feels like I'm all bound up and I can't run free, but I remember my God. And then he says something very interesting, and this is in many ways an instruction to the church of all ages. Notice verse 6, be angry, yeah, life hurts, I get mad, right? Life hurts, I get mad, it's, it's not right. Be angry, but don't sin. You know what I think that is? Don't react. Because when you react, it's pure emotion, and it's not faith, and you get yourself in a world of difficulty. How does the New Testament talk about anger? Anger never accomplishes the righteousness that God wants. Ooh, I don't know about you, that one hits me hard, because I, I got a good anger quotient in my body, right? Be angry, don't sin. But then watch what he says. Ponder in your own hearts, on your beds, and be silent. I want you to think about this. Now, we're talking about ancient people who probably lived in a home of brick or stone, maybe 12 feet by 12 feet. They had a little cooking corner, and they had some roll-out beds, but mostly they lived their lives outside. But if they wanted some peace and quiet to think, they went into their quiet space, and they did what? Well, he says, ponder in silence. They went to the back room and closed the door where they had some time to think. You know what they did? Uh, this psalmist doesn't even mention the word, but it, is the, it was the culture of the people of God. I want to take you to Psalm 107 for a minute. If you have your own Bible, if not, just, just listen up. Psalm 107 is a case study in what God's people did when they went into the back room to think. You see, the verb they used back then was not, I think I'll go ponder. You ever hear anybody say, I think we'll go ponder for a while. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's what I do when I go to a hospital and walk into the cancer ward. 
I had cancer 20 years ago, so I have a ministry to a lot of cancer people throughout my days. I'll go to a hospital, I'll walk into the cancer ward, and I'll meet somebody that just got diagnosed with leukemia, and I look at them, and they look like they just got hit by a truck. Oh, I know that feeling. It feels like, I call it diagnosis shock. You're in shock because they just told you the truth, and the truth is scary. And I sit down, and what do I do? Do I give them medical advice? I don't have any medical advice. I'm a preacher. I don't, I'm not a doctor. I'm not an oncologist. I'm not a hematology oncologist. You know what I do? I say to them, let me tell you what I remember. I remember having diagnosis shock. I really do. It's a kick in the gut, man. It's, that's a tough few days. I remember talking to a doctor who had the grace to tell me the truth and tell me he was going to fight for us. I remember how hard chemotherapy was. I remember crying out to the Lord when I didn't have any words, and all I could say was, oh, God. And I remember getting better because God answered my prayers. See, to remember is an activity. It's not just a flash that goes through your head. It's a dedicated activity that says, I have to remember where I was, what he did, and where I am now because he answered me. Now, back to Psalm 107. This is a long psalm, but it's a remembering psalm. Trace with me, if you have your Bibles, verse 4. Now listen. Some, some were in debt wastes, finding no way to a city to dwell in. They were hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted. Then they cried out to the Lord, and He delivered them. Verse 8, let them thank the Lord for His yeah, steadfast love. That's, that's more. That's, that's for his never-ending pursuit of us no matter what. Okay? Now, that's some. What's the psalmist talking about? Well, he's talking about a couple of hundred years ago when our people came out of the land of Egypt and they wandered like drunken sailors in the desert and they didn't know where the heck they were and they didn't know where the heck they were going, but God was with them. And they cried out, and he answered, and then they were able to praise. Now, watch it again. Verse 10. Some sat in darkness and in the shadow of death, prisoners in affliction and in irons because they had rebelled against the Word of God. Well, who are those? Well, those are people who in their rebellion got themselves into a world of hurt and now they're in a life or death situation. Then, verse 13, then they cried out to the Lord and He delivered them because God is not an empty suit. He answers. Let them, verse 15, let them thank the Lord for His never-ending, always pursuing stubborn love. Verse 17, some were fools through their sinful ways. Ever been there? Ever been really dumb, made a really dumb decision, taken some really stupid act actions that got you in all kinds of trouble? Yeah, you, you've been there. These are your people right here. You are their people. Some were fools, verse 19, then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and He delivered them. Verse 21, let them thank the Lord for His never-ending, always pursuing steadfast love. 23, some went down to the sea in ships. That, that's, that, that's that language for they got busy in business. They got in plane, they flew to different cities, they made deals, they sold product, they, they brought in money, and then they blew it. Verse 28, then 
They cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. Let them thank the Lord. You see how the psalmist works is not just to say to you, I, I hope you'll find peace one day. The psalmist tells you how. He says, I want you to be busy remembering your history. Your history. Now, it may be your personal history. You go back five years and it brings you to a time when you were in trouble and God brought you through it and therefore I can trust Him again. It may be your congregation's history. I, maybe I didn't go through this, but somebody in my church went through this. Infertility or the loss of a child or a horrible cancer diagnosis or they lost their job and lost everything they owned. Oh, that's, that's us. And if you don't have it in your congregation, maybe you have to go back to the Old Testament and rem remember some were wandering around and they didn't know where home was and they were homeless and some were, and some had cancer and some died but God brought others through it. You see, the sum, that's our history. That's our story. And in our story, always, 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 He hears, He delivers, and we praise Him. That's what the psalmist in Psalm 4 did when he went into the bedroom and pondered. He remembered on purpose. And that's what we're called to do, to remember on purpose. And when we do, watch what happens. Verse 7, you have put more joy in my heart than the men, the world around me have when they got all the food they need and all the, all the drink they want. They think they're happy. They're at a party. I have joy because I belong to the one who hears and answers because he really is my God. I have more joy and I have peace. Verse 8. Now you know, I think probably, that the word peace in the Hebrew is the word shalom. And shalom doesn't just mean I have a easy, peaceful feeling. Remember that? Yeah, remember? I, I can't sing, but you, you remember that? That's not what it is. Peace is a big deal. It means life is, it's under the bubble of God's grace and everything feels like it's working the way it's supposed to. There's justice for those that need it. There's love. I'm accepted. Yeah, I work hard, but at the end of the day, oh man, that was worthy. Life has dignity, it has purpose, it has joy. I get forgiven when I sin, I make confession when I sin, and God sets things right. That's shalom. Life is, life is as it is supposed to be under the umbrella of our God's love. So what happens when you have peace? Being therefore justified by faith, I have Peace with God? What happens when you got peace? Watch. I lie down and I sleep because I dwell in safety. It, what a beautiful poetic picture of the blessings of God for the people who remember and therefore they don't fear. They have peace. They sleep because they know my God has my back. How do you know that? Because your God came into your flesh and went to your cross and took your punishment to set you right. 
so that you would always be able to say, I remember a love that pursued me and chased me down and loved me all the way to the cross. Jesus sang this psalm. Can you imagine that? He's walking along with his disciples. I look to people in the, in the right and to my left when I'm sitting at a stoplight. A lot of people sing. I do too. Sing a lot. Um, not well, but loud. <laughs> we sing, right? I mean, that Christians sing. We sing and we make melody in our hearts and we sing things out. We remember songs. I've had, I've had issues with Jesse over time because he picks a song, it gets into a loop in my head and I can't get it out of there for like two weeks. We sing. Jesus walked with his disciples. He sang. God's people sang. And when his disciples felt constrained by the Jews and by the Romans and by the threats, he said, no, 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 no don't worry about that. No that the Lord is Yahweh. He hears and He saves. And that's why I'm here. I don't know where you are right now. I don't know how you feel. But I know how you should feel if He is your God. I pray that you find peace. Let's pray. Father, we ask you to give us that peace that joy, that identity, that access to a God who is there and who hears and who answers and who delivers and whom we can praise. Thank you for this church, for all of the stories of all of these people blended together into the story of God's people here. When we remember you, then we trust you. And when we remember Jesus, then we praise you. In his name, amen.